I am a real pro bike yeah. person, but I'm definitely not anti drivers or anti car. Right. I just think that in many of our built environments, in many of our cities, there is just not enough space to give everybody just drive. And I'm definitely not up for this car versus bike story. No, right. I mean, we are just building cities for people. And it turns out that in many, many contexts, it's better to, to fit a bike lane than a, than a car lane. And it's actually more efficient, safer, greener, healthier, and more inclusive. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. I'm John Simmerman, and that was Lior Steinberg, co-founder of the firm Humankind and author of the new children's book, The Car That Wanted to Be a Bike. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful having you along for the ride. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Lior. Lior, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns Podcast. Welcome. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Really happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So where are you joining us from? Uh, I'm sitting here in Rotterdam in the offices of Humankind. Okay, fantastic. Uh, That's great. My office. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's really in the heart of Rotterdam. So it's uh, my view is uh, very Dutch. Very Dutch. <laughs> That's I'm, fantastic. I'm, I'm looking at two bike lanes here. So uh, for those of uh, the audience, members of the audience who may not know who you are, I'm sure quite a few of them do, but uh, some I'm sure don't. Uh, what's sort of your background? What, what's your story? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm originally, I'm, I'm from Israel. Uh, I was born in Tel Aviv. I grew up there. I started my, let's say, adult life as uh, a computer programmer, actually. Uh, so I worked with, uh, yeah, I, w- I was programming, working with data, but very quickly I discovered that I prefer uh, to work with people and on the life of people. And I was kind of bored working uh, behind the computer. Uh, and that was the beginning of my transition to urban planning. And that was uh, some 10 years ago already where I decided to move to Sweden to study urban planning, uh, do my master's there, and then later on to the Netherlands, um, started to work as a planner and later started, uh, co-founded the Humankind office. Okay, so you, you know, Tel Aviv, Sweden, uh, where were you at in Sweden? So before Sweden, it was Berlin. So oh, first, in Berlin, Berlin okay, in too, Germany. Berlin and then Sweden, okay. And then Sweden, Stockholm. Yeah, uh, okay, Stockholm. Uh, it was lovely and cold at times. <laughs> uh, and uh, then to Groningen in the Netherlands. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a stop. That's where I, I kind of fell in love with Dutch cycling and uh, really investigated cycling to everything about cycling from the width of, this, of the bike lane to the strategic plan of the city or yeah. other Dutch cities. And yeah, now then moved to Rotterdam, which is on the other side of the country, which for yeah. most people uh, around the world sound, sound a lot, but in the Netherlands, it means two and a half hours. With the right, right. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so what years were you in uh, uh, Groningen? So I moved to Groningen in uh, 2016. No, sorry, 2012. 12. 12. Okay, 2012. Yeah. I'm just okay. curious because I, I visited there in 2015 uh, when I spent I, a I month. There, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was it was a it was a wonderful wonderful really? trip uh, and and it was a, a wonderful couple days there in, in Groningen and that's one of the cities that um, you know everybody hears about Amsterdam, right? Everybody hears about Utrecht. And, and increasingly now I'm trying to, you know, point out that, that Rotterdam is a really wonderful city for people to consider uh, because of the, uh, the relevance that it, it has to other North American cities and other cities around the globe that are more car centric and trying to make transformations. Uh, but Groningen was one of those those cities that uh, I had wanted to visit and was really, really glad that I did, mainly to, to experience how they handled the traffic circulation plan of not allowing motor vehicles to cut right through the middle. So that was huge for me. 
Yeah, I think that Groningen is well. It's it it is really it is, it is Valhalla, and I don't I don't I wouldn't take someone from New York or from right. uh, from Tel Aviv uh, to visit Groningen to 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 copy Groningen. You cannot right. copy Groningen. It is forty years, fifty years ahead of any other city. Right. Uh, right. Definitely Rotterdam. That would be the the yeah. That would be the a good example for cities around the world. Yeah. But I think that Groningen shows. First of all, that it's possible to run a country around a bicycle, a, a city around a bicycle. Right. And second of all, at least in Europe, the majority of people don't live in cities like Amsterdam or Rotterdam. And also right. in the US, I would say most people don't live in mega cities or in big cities. They actually live in quite small cities, yeah. up to half a million. Yeah. Most American cities are up to half a million. Groningen right. is 200 or 250. So the, yeah. the area around Groningen, the metropolitan of Groningen is around 400, I would say. Yeah. And yeah. I think. A lot of unimportant, unheard cities are from uh, are, are of this size, so you could, you could learn a lot from small yeah. cities that nobody heard of. Yeah, and and it's a university town too. So yeah, so you have a lot yeah. of those all around the world, uh, and th- these are also probably the, those cities with the greatest potential to become bicycle heavens because they have all those young people right. that are willing to cycle and they have no money for cars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. Well, before we dive into uh, humankind and uh, and 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 that, since we did just talk a little bit about uh, Rotterdam and uh, the relevance of Rotterdam, um, I want to show a, a quick little video clip of uh, the last time that you and I spent time together, which was in 2019. And wow, uh, we did, it, yeah, it was it was really fun. We uh, time flies, huh? I know, can you, I know. Can you believe it? And uh, so the setup to this was that we were um, we were actually together because of a People for Bikes uh, study tour that uh, had been traveling around to, to multiple different cities. And um, we had the opportunity to, to, to go out and ride in, in Rotterdam. Rotterdam was our second stop of uh, three different cities uh, for this particular study tour. And um, you were our ride leader. So you took, around, you know, took the, the group around and, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be tagging along with this particular study tour, um, documenting it. So I was filming the entire time. So I captured a little bit of, of, uh, of Rotterdam and, and a little bit of you talking about this wonderful transformation. So we'll, we'll play this. And that'll, I think that'll be a wonderful jumping off point to to re-emphasize what we were just talking about in terms of the power that Rotterdam has as a relevant example for other cities from around the globe. So let's uh, let's cue this up and uh, press hey, play. Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> I love this street, by the way. Also, I showed you the before and after of that one. Oh, yeah. That street used to look like this street. Just pass the pictures around if you don't believe. And I want to share, first of all, again, as I, as I mentioned, there is way too much um, car-oriented public space in Rotterdam. You know this street from before. Uh, this neighborhood also is now getting much better and Press uh, stop on that, <laughs> pause on that, because it's going to go right into into Amsterdam. But I wanted to play that because I thought that was really fun uh, to be able to get a little bit of that. Now, all of those images weren't necessarily uh, the most uh, relevant, except for when we were stopped and you were talking about the transition of that uh, that in the conversion of some of those travel lanes. Talk a little bit about that uh, as an example of. Uh, the relevance for other cities globally to, to learn from what Rotterdam has learned and maybe even give a little bit of the historical context because we did see a little bit of the older kind of area, but much of Rotterdam doesn't look like that because much of Rotterdam was destroyed in World War II. Yes, I think if we pick that point in history where the city was 
kind of bombed uh, by by the Nazis. Uh, before that, it looked like any other Dutch town that our listeners or viewers might imagine. So it looked pretty much like Amsterdam uh, or Utrecht uh, or The Hague. And it was bombed like some other Dutch cities uh, during the war. But Rotterdam was really heavily bombed and then was rebuilt in a very modernistic uh, post-war architecture and as you know, the Dutch are very good in planning and also back then they were very good in planning and also executing. So some of the most car-oriented, modernistic neighborhoods were actually built in the Netherlands, not only in Rotterdam, but Rotterdam got a city center that was very, very much car-centered, where you could basically get from anywhere to anywhere with a car and parking schemes were very, very developed. So it was really easy to get to a shop in the city center with a car and park or pick up your things and then uh, continue. And I think that I'm, I'm not an historian of Rotterdam, but if I would, I would say that the next important point in history, so you had the seventies where um, a lot of Dutch cities went through sort of uh, revival. Uh, of course, Amsterdam and Groningen that we discussed before, uh, they applied a uh, project, um, they applied things like um, circulation plans or closing down the city center for cars. And that's where you get Amsterdam the way it looks today, or Groningen or Utrecht. And then you have Rotterdam that in the 90s also realized that the city center is kind of dead. Uh, it is very car oriented. Uh, it is dangerous at some po pa parts, either from safety point of view, but also from a car safety point of view. And you want to attract more people to the streets. And that's where the city started to densify, build more housing in the city center, a city that used to be a very, very work oriented. So a lot of people came from outside Rotterdam to the city uh, and left at the end of the day. Suddenly people start to move to the city. Uh, more housing was built, uh, more mixed use housing was built and streets started to be transformed from roads to actually streets. And I think that in the recent 15 years, it's really been booming. I mean, the city has been investing all, so much effort and money in uh, transforming uh, streets, in uh, like, let's say, streets that are mostly giving space to cars, to streets that have wider sidewalks, more interesting and relaxing uh, places to stop at. And of course, also very good public um, um, bicycle infrastructure. And uh, unlike Amsterdam or Utrecht or Groningen, the streets here are wider, so the roads are wider and the right of way is wider, and therefore there is also a lot of space to to install proper wide bike tracks that really right. can transfer a lot of people. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, I've I, I keep you know really singing the praises of Rotterdam as a a wonderful example for other cities uh, to consider, and uh, definitely as I continue to head back over to the Netherlands um, uh, and and explore different cities, uh, Rotterdam will always be on my list of cities to consider when I'm bringing uh, individuals over uh, to lead my own study tours. Uh, because of its relevance, uh, you know, back to especially North American cities and, and for uh, cities, uh, you know, in other car centric areas. I mean, you know, why not? Because, you know, if you're trying to imagine what it would be like to convert those lanes over to a much more people oriented place and uh and also some of the other conversions because it's not just the streets it's also housing and 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 many other things as meaningful destinations in the downtown area because that was one of the aha moments that the city was experiencing is that uh, you know, post World War II, they they you know built a lot of modern towers and all of this sort of stuff. But it, and but people were, you know, the the downtown area was dead. There was no vibrancy. So bringing that vibrancy back is such an incredible important point. In point. Yeah, and just to be fair, I think I mean, I mean, of course, there was street there was street life, and you cannot compare it to. It's very easy to say, hey, you come from America and look at Rotterdam and you can copy paste it. It, 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 it. Rotterdam was in a better state than most cities around the world. It, sure, it still right. had these pockets of good street life and still had some sort of street 
fabric that worked well, right. but they did so many mistakes and they did them very well. So yeah. they, they, they built this city completely with the back to the water. So that, that right. was a mistake that now really difficult to fix. And I think Nether uh, Rotterdam can look at other cities, how they fix it. Yeah, yeah. And also that they realized that they have to start competing with cities like Amsterdam, Utrecht and right. uh, The Hague on population, because why would you live in a car centric and noisy and polluted city where 20 minutes away you have great places to live at. So I think Rotterdam just realized they have to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the other uh, elephant in the room there is, uh, is of course, the, uh, the fact that transit was very good. And so there was there was that transit connection that yeah. you know, is, you know, throughout the throughout the Netherlands. And so, uh, you know, yes, you're, I take your point. It's not superly, uh, super easy to just copy and paste. Uh, but certainly that experience of the streetscape and real, realizing we need to transform what was car centric design over to more human oriented design it's a wonderful example of what is possible yeah Yeah, and also when we were walking there i I told you look at the pictures if you don't believe i mean that's why i'm I'm keep printing those pictures the the speed of change here is so quick right uh sometimes i i'm very impatient i'm thinking oh my god it's so slow but then i would walk a year later in in a neighborhood and it looks completely different and then you you realize how quickly speed of changes right uh, and that's why when i when i lead a tour i always print uh, the pictures of before and it's not pictures from the 70s uh, black and white it's pictures from two years ago right and you can really see how the city uh, changed in the last five years 10 years and 15 years but also yeah. yeah in the last one one year yeah 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 <laughs> that's crazy it's crazy so you sent over a, a fun little slide presentation um uh, called Lava. What's what's the setup uh, to this slide presentation? And we'll we'll try to describe each of these images for our audio only audience as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll pull up this uh, initial uh, image here. So so what are we looking at here? And uh, and sort of give the setup to this uh, this PowerPoint or this the this slide presentation. Yes. Yeah, so what we have here. I mean, I mentioned before that I like. Um, I used to work as a computer programmer and I still do a lot of scripting and urban analytics using, uh, you know, GIS, but also then some coding. And uh, basically I try to translate small moments in life into maps or data sheets that can really show you how the scale of urban issues, problems or opportunities. So I I made a presentation a a few months ago in Amsterdam and I wanted to show, uh, it, it was about communities of care and mainly building cities that are accessible for people with uh, physical or uh, mental um, uh, limitations. Or, um, and what I, I thought is to bring uh, a picture, uh, which is not very beautiful, of a street in Amsterdam. Uh, what we see in this picture is yeah, two, two trash cans, which are underground trash cans, which are amazing. I, I also heard you talking about them in one of your previous uh, episodes. And, right, uh, yeah. Uh, there, there's also great, not just Spike, a video about them. So yeah. they, they are indeed um, very useful and they can, uh, it's those sort of, I don't know how to describe them, but they're those sort of uh, small trash cans that have below them huge containers, but they are underground, so they don't... Right. You don't see them, right? Yeah, yeah. But actually, what you also see here, and this is something you see all over Amsterdam, is a street that someone who is using a wheelchair or even a stroller with a baby cannot cross. Yeah. So they will be forced to... It, it, the, the sidewalk is just too narrow and it's not... The surface is not smooth. So it's very... You have all those, yeah, problems to cross there and then you have this commercial on the the electric uh, uh, closet right so and then a, a, a parking moped and then bicycle park there and of course the cars park it's, it's impossible to walk on the sidewalk right and that's yeah. why so many people in amsterdam are walking on the road right uh but not everybody can or is willing or daring right so then i thought yeah it's like i mean f- for me, it's not a problem. I can just jump about uh, around it. But someone with a wheelchair just can't. For them, it's like 
a wall or uh, it's just like you would go out of of your house and it will just be filled up with the street will be water and you will not be able to go out of your house this is what someone with a wheelchair would see yeah, yeah, it's almost like here. an so obstacle then, course, right? You know, it's like you've got yeah. you've got chunked up uh, bits of of brick here and some concrete, and then you've got uh, you have to sort of do a slalom course around the scooters and the bikes parked in the in the the pavement there. So yeah, you're you're right. So it is kind of like this this water, or or I guess that's why you called it lava. So uh, what, what's on the next yeah, slide here? Then, yeah, yeah. Then you have like the if you if you can move to the next the water, slide, you see yeah. water. Okay, so that's what would happen if you would go out and suddenly there would be water then that's it your journey is over right yeah. unless you know how to swim yeah or willing right. to get wet but then i spoke with someone from the from the place from Paco Schweifer where i was giving the talk and she said hey it's a little bit like the, the game the street the, the floor is lava ah. do, do you have it in the u.s I, i'm not sure if you have <laughs> the it. floor is lava <laughs> yeah so i thought like hey what would what if that's so that's that's actually what happens in Amsterdam in those streets? And then yeah. I thought, let's map all the all the streets in Amsterdam yeah. that have lava flow where people could not walk. Oh, well, yeah. you don't see the map here. Uh, I think. And it, then I have a. There it is. There it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, yeah. so you, you you guys did that, and you're, you're like, all right, let's map some of these areas where you know you don't have that level of um, accessibility. And you've got areas of, of lava. Yeah. So what you see here is actually Amsterdam, which is considered all around the world as a as a world leading city in active mobility. Right. But the city is on fire. Yeah. If you look at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are so many streets that are either what what we picked up here are places where the sidewalk is too narrow, which mm -hmm. meaning less than one meter, which means you can literally not walk with a stroller or uh, with a wheelchair can right. pass by. And you also see uh, places that are way too uh, busy with obstacles on on sidewalks, etc. So it's just right. a small trick just to see the how big the problem is and yeah. how much Amsterdam still needs to do to actually be an accessible city. Right. It's easy to be in an accessible city for people who can cycle or are uh, willing to go through this uh, obstacle course. Right. But the real mission of Amsterdam is to be a real accessible city and it's right. not the case still yeah, yeah. and I'm sure that the same map uh, that we see here can be done for most Dutch cities and actually for most cities around the world I think most cities around the world are kind of on fire the, yeah. the, the streets are still lava for yeah. for people with uh, difficulties or uh, physical uh, uh, limitations yeah yeah what a, what a powerful way to reframe it and create a visual is that visualization of, 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 you know, lava, you know, this is impassable. So yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. And, and I, 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 the reason that we have it in, uh, we can make it in Amsterdam is because Amsterdam has so much open data and it yeah. is so accessible yeah. that I thought, um, I mean, of course, maybe you cannot make this picture for any city, but it doesn't mean that the, 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 the problem is not there. It's just that most cities are really afraid to share their data. And Amsterdam is a city that is doing it very well. They're really opening up their data. It is very accessible if you know a little bit of yeah, using uh, using GIS or right. some, some coding, you can yeah. reach the data. It looks like you grabbed some data here, too, for uh, the, the standing urinals and the unisex toilets. Yeah, I saw on, uh, was it on Reddit, someone wrote, why does Amsterdam have so little um, to public toilets? And then right. I, I mean, I don't live in Amsterdam, but I go there often. And then I normally drink a beer and then I normally need to go to the toilet. And I yeah. never experienced not having access to toilet. Just to realize that actually I always use the urinal, right. uh, of course. But not everybody can use the urinal. Yeah. Actually, at least half of our society cannot use the urinal. Yeah. And then I just thought, ah, oh, let's map uh, the 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 urinal versus the non-urinal. And then you see, actually, Amsterdam has a lot of public toilets every few minutes of walking. Yeah. But only for half of the population. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although we all pay taxes and we all deserve the same service. Yeah. Yet we provide very different service. Of course, it's very easy to just yeah. place a urinal. Yeah. It is also a very big problem in Amsterdam, men just going around and peeing on the streets. So it, like, it's very, yeah. very common by men to do it. 
uh, versus women. And yet, uh, there are so many people in our society that, that have problems. They cannot just wait to get home or yeah. uh, restaurants will not let them in. So, I mean, just to see, again, a, a simple map that just shows the difference, just a small trick just to, yeah. to raise the issue. And I, I find that the, it is a, a an interesting overlay when you do the side by side comparison of, you know, sort of the the inhospitable, inhospitable <laughs> you know, environment and, you know, the, the, the lack of, of quality of life attention to, you know, sidewalks that are like lava and then areas where you, you know, you have a gap in in, you know just, you know, services. And, and so, you know, these are the types of, of amenities that are, are crucial to quality of life and dignity towards, you know, to everyone, towards people, uh, dignity towards those who may have mobility issues and are not able to do the slalom course, you know, dignity to the other half of our population, you know, that can't just go use necessarily or feel comfortable using, you know, the, the facilities that are, you know, prevalent out there. So I, I love that you were able to, uh, you know, sort of blend those two <laughs> And, and slides one after the other, um, it, because you're right, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to take the fact that there was that data available. And that's a powerful thing for, for cities to start to, to really take a step back and use some of the, the data that they have. And if they don't have it, get it and, and take a good hard look in the mirror and try to understand, you know, what they're presenting out to their population as well as their visitors. And I think, I mean, most cities have data. It's, yeah. um, I mean, most cities have a lot of data. They don't even know how to use it. Right. Uh, I think most cities are also very, uh, they're not willing to, to share it. They think right. it's, they own it. Municipality thing, they own the data, although we all, pay right. for it and yeah, yeah. we are all actually creating it by living in the city right and i think it's, it's only fair to at least make it so if you have very limited budget to understand your data use this entire budget just to make the public interface easy and accessible right. make it all open and let um, volunteers activists ngos use it and you would be really surprised how yeah, how much value you can get by just opening it up and let both the market, but also the, the civil society and the, the NGOs and, uh, in, and just people who are interested and want to help and can script a little bit or also want to learn about the city and they still don't know how to script or to code, but want to use this data because this is data that is very meaningful for them and we all own it. Eh? So I, yeah. I would say, I would say let, just open the data. I mean, it's ridiculous how difficult it is sometimes to get so simple information like um, the width of streets yeah and, yeah so, uh, or the locations of public toilets or um, the, the the planned bicycle infrastructure in the coming five years the city has this data and many cities just keep them to themselves yeah and I just pulled up your website. And so this is the landing page there. And right there, it says, what if data could be human? And, you know, it's so I get the sense that this is very much this is very much a passion of yours and of your firms. And uh, why don't you just give a little bit of a, a overview of of the firm, uh, how you how you and your, your partners uh, have come to form it and uh, the types of services that you uh, you provide? Yeah, so. I, yeah, I'm afraid I, I should not talk about it for too long because I will get lost, of course, because we do a lot of different things. Yeah, keep it short. <laughs> uh, for, <laughs> but unfortunately, but uh, basically, I'm as I mentioned, I'm more, let's say, analytical in my, let's say, in my uh, craft. I'm, I'm, I came from from computers, and I'm I'm an urban planner, which is also kind of let's say analytical. But my partner, to humankind, Joran Veminov, he came from the NGO world, from the media and culture, and uh, working with children in poverty in Argentina. Wow. Okay. Um, and we just thought to combine it here in the Netherlands uh, by working on urbanism and its connections to society and how to make urban change while involving different point of views 
um, different disciplines. Uh, so in that sense, we are a little bit of Trojan horse, uh, of, of a Trojan horse in, in cities because we are entering as sort of either from the urban planning side or from the society side or from the <laughs> quality of life angle. And then we, we try to um, invite other parts of the municipality to work together on making a real change. Because we do realize that we cannot fix a city by just working on mobility or just working on public spaces or just working on poverty programs. Yeah, We have to use our resources smartly and combine them in order to make a real change. So at Humankind, we, we try to, I mean, we, we are working on projects that are anywhere from small public space design through urban analytics to urban strategies. So I've recently worked on the Tel Aviv bicycle strategy, uh, but we are also working on experiment uh, policy for a certain area in the city. Mm -hmm. And we are also actually experimenting using some tactical urbanism to do it. So we are doing yeah. everything from everything and just trying to, to find an angle different angles to improve the city. Yeah. And I was, you just mentioned Tel Aviv. So obviously it is an international firm. You guys are doing work all over the place. Yeah, we are uh, Rotterdam based, but uh, at least I see myself as, I mean, I mean I'm Israeli, of course, uh, but also European. I like to work everywhere. I think that the Netherlands has a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge that it can share with the world. So this is what I do a lot. But the Netherlands can also learn a lot from other countries. I mean, in some in some aspects, Dutch cities are doing so badly, and we can learn from uh, cities all around the world. So I also um, am very happy to work in other cities, but also just visit other cities like you do mm -hmm. and learn. Right. Because I think you, you you could you could bring so much knowledge here back back to the Netherlands, and this yeah this knowledge uh, exchange really leads to 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 great great uh, urban solutions. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the, you, we, we saw the image of Meredith Glazer uh, in, in that video clip, and that's one of the conversations that she and I had about that, uh, you know, how important it is to have that spirit of learning and being willing to and open to, to absorb and learn from the experience of other places and not thinking that, you know, hey, we've got it all figured out. We, you know, no, it's like, benchmark and, and learn from other other places and um and we had sort of you know mentioned the whole copy paste you know thing it's probably not going to be a copy paste you're going to learn from it and no. and 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 get some you know in you know some ideas and there may be things that can be copied and paste but more likely there's going to be a process of interpretation and and application and customizing things to to meet the needs uh, of your your population uh so yeah point well taken yeah and i think also as a teacher i mean I'm, i've been t i've been teaching some i mean we have with the we're doing with the eat with use organization yeah uh, some teaching uh, and workshops in other countries. And you also need to always remember to be humble. Yes. Uh, because when you are coming to another country, I mean, you know very little on it. Yeah. Uh, about You know very little on the rules. All you can say is, hey, let me please share with you my yeah. lessons from those countries. Right. And then hear you, what are your issues? And do you think this information might be useful for you? And how can you adapt it to your local um context yeah. and definitely i'm never staying there so right. i can go there and promise that my knowledge is going to change the world but first of all i'm not going to be there to do it second of all i have no the, the local skills to do it and right. the, the people there need to adapt it to their context to their way of working and then with it whatever they feel is useful so yeah. i can yeah. only just share some examples yeah. And what's great about that, too, is, you know, you've got that sharing and you've got that knowledge exchange. And then at the same time, you know, each will add a little bit of creativity and, and all of that. And then, you know, other folks can be looking over and going, oh, OK, they, they borrowed from over here and they applied this. And what they did was yeah. pretty creative and innovative. And, you know, that very first city <laughs> that was benchmarked might be like, ooh, I like how they interpreted that. Maybe we could try that, too. So that spirit I, of continuous I mean, really improvement. 
Absolutely, and I think I mean I I don't even bring the U.S. to the to the to the party because I uh, I'm just working here in Europe mostly. Sure, sure. I really think that Europe Europe has so much aspects. Uh, I'm I don't know how how folks in the U.S. see Europe as just one the same place or a huge place that is so diverse. But for instance, I I've been to I've been to uh, Poland to Warsaw. Mm-hmm. They have amazing urban parks. Right. The Netherlands can learn so much about how they design right. their parks and create places for people. I've been out to Istanbul that have a sort of this public cafes where they sell tea for very, very, very cheaply. So everybody can afford going to the park right. uh, and drink cafe outdoor in the best locations in the city. And this is something that does not exist in the Netherlands. Hey, why, why can't we learn it from Istanbul, yeah, bring yeah. it to the Netherlands? Of course, they can learn from us on uh, cycling, but yeah. we can definitely learn from them or on making fair public cafes. Yeah, uh, and then I'm sure we can learn a lot from America and from South America and Africa, etc., and Asia. But even only in Europe, there is so much difference and so much different ways of uh, designing public space and solving uh, social issues in public yeah. space. Yeah. That I think we, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to just trying to to solve the problems in the same way and not look around. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it's I, I totally agree. Now, so the other recent project that you've been involved with was, uh, you know, putting your, your creativity hat on and, uh, you know, coming up. And, and so now you're a published author and uh, here's your book, <laughs> The Car <laughs> That Wanted to Be a Bike. Uh, so obviously this is a children's book. Uh, what's the story behind uh, your desire to write this? Yeah, thanks. So I actually my entire plan was just to call myself a published author. That's it. Okay, perfect. It that's it. Done. No, that's it. We are very done. Ch- you no, check so, that one off. <laughs> <laughs> no, so actually, it was, it, it, again, it's a, just a fun project. And of course, it doesn't, uh, it's not my profession whatsoever. Uh, but what happened is was that I was uh, sitting here in the office with, with uh, my colleagues. Uh, I, I don't know if I sent you a picture of how it looks, but like we looked outside of the office. I think I sent mm-hmm. you a real picture of Rotterdam. Yeah, let's and... get, let's uh, we'll, we'll slide over there. We'll skip uh, past a couple of these images that are from here. But yeah, yeah. This so this is your your image that you sent over. Yeah, so this is the view from my office. Which, by the way, uh, if you see it, you see that it's cold and uh, rainy because uh, this is a typical Dutch day. But <laughs> it also. <laughs> It is also quite car centric, I would say, but this area is going to become a, a huge uh, park. So just for uh-huh. information. Uh, well, but what to you your also point see that you said earlier is that you know things are constantly changing, and exactly. you know, in the blink of an eye, you're going to be like, "Oh wow, that looks totally yeah. different now." <laughs> so actually, we are looking at it, we are looking at it all day long and yeah. just waiting for the moment it's going to become a park. Yeah. Uh, but until then, uh, it has two really really wide. Uh, bike lanes, right. bike, bike tracks in, in both sides. Uh, I would say they are like f- four or five meter wide. They're, they are really mm-hmm. wide. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know how much it would be in feet, but uh, they are... Uh... It's wide. <laughs> it's wide. So you could really cycle. Uh, it's both bi-directional. So in each side, you can cycle to both directions. And then I would say that you can cycle in each to each side with three people next to each other. So there might be like five, six people cycling next to each other. Just imagine a very wide side uh, bike track. Yeah. And then Joran, my, my partner here at Humankind, he pointed out that there is a car stuck on, on one of those because it was rather new, this bike this bike track, and the entrance to it was a bit confusing. Uh, and a car got stuck on it and all the bikes, it was a rush hour, so all the bikes tried to like go around the car and shout at him. Uh, because it's it's very it's it's not very usual that cars end up on bike tracks in right, the Netherlands right. uh, because they are so used to it. But that was a mistake. And, and Joran uh, told me, uh, my, yeah, he told me, look at it. This stupid car is stuck on the bike track. And I said, like, why why would you judge this car? It want to be a, a bicycle. It yeah. tries to be a bicycle. And, why and, not? And then I thought, <laughs> and then I thought, oh, look at all those poor cars. Uh, stuck in traffic in the city, all of them probably would just want to be a bicycle and enjoy enjoy the freedom of cycling. And that's when I I, I, I thought about uh, a book on 
about Johnny, which is like a lovely car. Yeah. Uh, it goes around, uh, goes around uh, the city and realizes that uh, cycling is so much better and it dreams to become a bicycle. Yeah. So yeah. I think if if if, if here, you in fact the, here here Johnny is he 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 tried to <laughs> occupy the 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 cycle track just like in the image. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is exactly what happened. Uh, that's what happens when Johnny wakes up in the morning and decides to be a bicycle. Yeah. And before that, uh, there are like those other urban scenes that you can see where the family of Johnny discovers how wonderful it is to stop going to the school with a with uh, a bike and use the uh, with a car and use actually a cargo bike and mm -hmm. all the other uh, children at the school are jealous because the children are getting to the school without standing in traffic yeah and slowly the this family discover out oh, i said this use a bike and uh, um, and johnny is uh, jealous and tries to become uh, yeah realizes that it yeah. the, his life is a yeah. Here he stays behind, where all the children are using a bicycle. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he wants to join, but he, but, he, but he can't. So it's yeah. a it was a fun project, and I was <laughs> really really happy that so many people actually bought the book and uh, sending me pictures of themselves with the book and with their children or grandchildren yeah. from all around the world. I mean, it was in. Uh, I got pictures from Australia and Mexico and uh, Israel and. Uh, and Korea, and uh, now it's only in English. I, I, I should probably translate it to more languages. I'm ah, just, uh, yeah, yeah. For some time, yeah, yeah. because children uh, normally don't speak. Not all children speak English, so yeah, uh, yeah. That's it. But you, you also got the book, no? I, I, uh, I got two. Book. Yeah, I, I, I don't have I children, two. but I got two, and uh, one went to a, a very close family friend, and then one went to a, a couple of nephews. So. Yeah, so oh, those have been uh, sent off. Uh, so hopefully they're enjoying them, and 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 so just to be clear, this is a, a very a very nice book and a and a wonderfully uh, approachable book. And you chose not to demonize cars. You made John Johnny the car. Um, you know, out to be, you know, it, it was just it, in the spirit of what you said earlier, you know, he don't, don't judge him. He, he just, he wants to be a bike. And so yeah. <laughs> the, just, just to let everybody know that it, it's the, this is really not hating on cars at all. In fact, Johnny ends up with a wonderful future. You know, what ends up happening at the end of the book? What is, what, what is, we'll, we'll, we'll spoil Shall the, we the spoil ending. spoil it to the people? I think we should yeah, so. because uh, it's, it, it, well, or, or we could just leave it as a cliffhanger and say, you know, it, it all works out fine for Johnny. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, I promise you that your children will be able to fall asleep at the end of the book. Uh, and I really, I'm really happy that you mentioned it. I mean, this is really, I mean, I am a real pro bike. Yeah. person but i'm definitely not anti-drivers or anti-car right. i just think that in many of our built environments in many of our cities there is just not enough space to give everybody just drive and i'm definitely not up for this car versus bike story no right. i mean we are just building cities for people and it turns out that in many many contexts it's better to to fit a bike lane than a, than a car lane and it's actually more efficient, safer, greener, healthier, and more inclusive. But in some cases, you need to use the car. We still didn't solve all urban problems with a bicycle. Uh, some people cannot use a bicycle, and they might need to use a car or use some other uh, vehicle. And we need to allow it. And I think that actually um, what you see in Dutch cities that uh, or not only Dutch cities, other cities that's really embraced cycling for the for the masses, yeah, and still allowed people to use the car when they really needed, yeah, or could uh, and really had to do it, yeah. That's the solution. It's not. It's not. The book is definitely not about the end is near. Cars need to be uh, burned, and yeah. we should all cycle now. Yeah. Uh, it would be a nice future. But it's definitely not realistic. And if you want to make a change, this is definitely not the way to go. There are very militant activists that want to right. to, to ban all cars tomorrow, and it just doesn't work. It just yeah. doesn't work. You need to have. Yes, that's uh, that's the story. 
Yeah, well, and, and, and again, I, I, I applaud you in, in terms of the, the framing and, uh, and being able to do that in a way that I think, uh, you know, is, is positive, it resonates well, and it doesn't kind of feed that, that narrative of divisiveness and hate and us versus them uh, sort of thing, which just isn't going to, it hasn't worked, you know, it, 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 there's, we have to be realistic about the fact that, uh, you know, yes, we, we need to call things out when there's an imbalance. And the story of the Netherlands is a, is a wonderful historical context of, mm-hmm. of the things that took place in the mm-hmm. 70s that sort of said, you know, look, we're going down the wrong path here. And, it, you know, and it wasn't just one particular movement. It was the con, you know, it, it was really a, 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 a bunch of different things happening all at the same time, including the, the oil embargo, including the kinder morts, including um, entire neighborhoods being torn down for, for, um, you know, streets. And so, yes, there were, there were protests and there were revolts and, and people stood up and said enough already, but, you know, so it may seem like, oh, conflict's the way to do this. We need to like stand up and fight It's yes, but <laughs> we also need to be realistic of, of understanding, uh, to your point that, uh, y- y- it doesn't serve us well in, in our modern era where we're at and cars aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but being able to create a city and one of my favorite, uh, example cities is Delft, um, being able, it's a, it's, it's a university town. It's a, not a particularly large city. Um, and, and yet they've been able to, to create a balance there and, you know, having the separate mobility networks and taming the automobile where it is incredibly important and and relevant for that taming to take place. And one of the specific areas that is so important to, to, to tame the automobile is in our public spaces in our squares. Talk a little bit about that because I know that's one of your areas of passion is, you know, when you're looking at your public spaces and your public spares, you know, squares, it's like, why are you have car parking there? <laughs> you know, you can make this public space, human space. Yeah, so I think I just it it really feeds well to the to the discussion because until now uh, I see that the majority of discussion on uh, cars versus bikes or mobility alternatives is always about let's replace car infrastructure car infrastructure with bicycle infrastructure and then what you get is that you get a lot of people that are used to use a car or forced to use a car because there is actually not a proper way to walk use the bus or cycle so they built their life around being forced to use a car and then keep hearing that they are devils that pollute uh, the environment and kill kids, although they are just uh, good people who were forced to use a car because they didn't have any alternative. And then you think, okay, how, how are we going to convince uh, people that uh, and politicians and uh, decision makers that we need to make this change? Yeah. And just by, by, by telling people, let's remove the car parking and car infrastructure and turn it into a wider sidewalk, that's not going to convince anyone. You need to yeah. offer something better. Right. And what happens is that once you can get rid of all the space given to uh, private motorized vehicles, you could turn it into great places for people to go out to, to, to meet each other, to play, to sport, to to have a drink, to fall in love, to meet a colleague, to to enjoy, to work. And you can build these places outside houses of people. So they actually don't need the car to get to the destination. The destination is getting close to, cl- closer to them. Yeah. And this is something that you can do very easily in dense cities. And that's why those are the, the places where you can get the quickest win. You go to dense cities that are still car-centric and you start slowly to replace car infrastructure, not with bike infrastructure, but with people infrastructure. You provide right. them ways to move nicely, but also places to sit, meet, uh, greet, and uh, enjoy life. Yeah. 
So uh, uh, I just put a, a, a photo up here on the screen. Uh, why don't you describe uh, what we're looking at here? Yeah, so we're seeing uh, a picture from Tel Aviv. Uh, I took it from Google Street View. Um, this is a quiet, well-off neighborhood in the city center. It has a lot of uh, young people people living here, but also people that, yeah, that can afford buying an apartment in such a expensive uh, city, and especially in the city center. And what we see is something that was built. It's, it's called Basel Square. By the, it's not the official name, but uh, that's, the, that's the name, uh, because the, the street name is Basel Street. And it is a square, but it is also an underground parking. And big part of the square uh, of the of the plaza basically was turned into a parking lane, I would say, to fit yeah, as yeah. much parking as possible. And just for context, uh, it is really terrible to find parking in Tel Aviv. I mean, mm -hmm. you can spend truly hours <laughs> circulate, especially like at six p.m. after working hours, just going around this the. The, the yeah the blocks trying to find parking and even this underground parking which is paid too cheap I think but still paid right. uh, as a big uh, tr um, lanes uh, of, of yeah basically just a queue of people trying to enter it so yeah <laughs> it's a big mess so what the city did and this is the second picture you show is that during corona they realized okay this street is not important for traffic and we want to create more places for people to be out uh, and have space in the public space, it, like have more space because we had to keep this one and a half meter distance from each other, etc. And what they did is that they chose several streets in the city, and this was one of them, and they closed them off. Uh, and basically they did it by just putting bollards and saying, okay, from now on, this is not parking, this is a pedestrian area. Right. And the city was very, uh, yeah, I, I think brave to do it because it is very, very, very difficult to remove parking spaces in Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv, I would say that either you have a car or you are a lawyer or you know someone who is a lawyer. So <laughs> whenever the city is uh, doing something like this, uh, the like the municipality is getting a lot of hate from uh, powerful residents. Although the majority of uh, people living in Tel Aviv, of course, don't, don't have a car, like in many uh, dense cities, uh, also other, uh, also European cities. Uh, the, Tel Aviv is not Europe, but it's it's kind of uh, reminding many European cities. And what the city did here, in my opinion, a mistake was that they just said, "Okay, no cars," but then what? They never offered the what. Mm. They never offered the. There was the stick, but there was no carrot. So they say, yeah, well, you can um, have more space for walking, but who wants to just walk in a boring street? So then um, uh, we work together with with, with few other uh, great organizations like like Urban 95, which is for the Von Deer Foundation, and of course our partners there, like Ar not always in architects, and the city, of course. And they ask us, hey, do you have any idea how to, to, to get this, uh, this square very quickly uh, become uh, alive uh, because uh, we see that it's not working and uh, if it will not work uh, we need to to reverse it back and we don't want to so, so it looks like this is a sketch. design you yeah. you did some design um, why don't you describe uh, what, what's it, what we're seeing here in this uh, this photo yeah so we basically decided to take off all bollards uh, that were there all parked mopeds that were standing there and we just put very simple um, uh, yeah kind of artificial grass on the floor mm -hmm. and uh, put places for people to sit and uh, especially parasols because uh, Tel Aviv is very sunny right. and we came with this design uh, within like less than a week because we really needed to be fast. So we just made this Photoshop and a short design and spoke with few stakeholders from the neighborhood, some residents and some shop owners and just came up with, with this. I'm, I'm amazed design. at how quickly the people came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that, that's the, the funny thing about those designs is that they always look so beautiful and full of people and sunny. Yeah. But that's the thing about Tel Aviv. Every time you put a bench in Tel Aviv, if it's a quiet and safe place, will, it will be directly filled with 
parents and children and grandparents bringing their grandchildren or just people on a date or just people in the middle of their uh, working uh, hours just grabbing a drink. And that was an amazing change. So we opened it. Yeah. And the place, now we see a picture of the reality. Yeah, because this, this, that- uh, this, again, folks, what we're looking at in this image, this was the mock-up and then this happened. This happened, yeah. So we see your children <laughs> already playing. Uh, the place is full every day with uh, yeah. with parents and, and children. And then if you go to the, I think it's the next image, you see more. Yeah. So this is another image of children playing. But then I think the next one would be, uh, and this what this is what I love. I mean, uh, for the first time, the mock-up looks less full than the actual reality. Right. <laughs> uh, so many people are filling the space and making their events, and there was not actually enough space for people to sit. Yeah. And on the left side, you see a, a piece of, of, of a big newspaper in Israel. Yeah. And there is a picture of the, of the space on the cover. And they, they ask here, why would the, the lockdown work? So, I, I mean, people didn't really listen. I think in the third lockdown, people stopped listening to the government and just went out. Well, I'm not in favor of it, right. but I was v- very proud that they showed a public space I worked on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, being filled up with people, I think it's, we now know that it's quite safe to sit out, uh, yeah. safe distance from each other. Uh, just having a coffee, it also really supports businesses that could not serve uh, people indoors and could just sit outdoors. Yeah. So it's just it's just funny to see that the place worked even when it was a bit illegal to to use it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's 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 really so incredibly powerful. And let's go right back over here to this very first slide so that you know folks can really appreciate what a transformation it was. And and again, we're not anti car. We're just, you know, making the point that when you are looking at creating uh, thriving places, places for people, you know, a a human scape, uh, it's like, you know, first step, you know, calm the environment, you know, bring the, the, the either bring the motor vehicle speeds down and or restrict access. And then, you know, do the programming, you know, put the elements in that really help support gathering of people. And if you can have the ability to add some whimsicalness to it and some play to it and some activity assets that that really draw families out. It's amazing what you can you know see happen in terms of vibrancy and people flocking to it. And we're so hungry for authentic places. Uh, that this is just such a wonderful, wonderful story. And, and it, yeah, that, I'm so glad that you uh, sent all this along because it, it's, it's so powerful to, to realize that um, our largest public spaces that we have in all of our cities around the world are in fact, you know, our, our streets and our public, sp- you know, our squares. And, and so much of that has been given over to the automobile exclusively and it doesn't have to be that way. In some pay, in, in some situations, there, it may be wide enough that it can be uh, delineated off, and, and each each mode and each uh, you know, it, it, and the humans can have space, and the cars can have space. And in some cases, there may be decisions that have to be made, and and you know, and this is a good example of uh, you know restricting the access. Uh, in, and I mentioned earlier, you know, also maybe just really traffic calming, bringing the motor vehicle speeds down. They still have access, but you know, at a much more of a calmed environment where the car is the guest to to you know sort of channel the Dutch auto de gast <laughs> uh, theme there. So, uh, Lior, is there anything that we haven't yet? cover that you really want to leave the audience with? Yeah, I think as, as, as a bridge from the last topic, I think that, I mean, you, you summed it up beautifully, but I would say that in that project, what you saw is that there was uh, a discussion around mobility, around cars versus not cars, and people were very, very angry and very passionate on fighting it. And on the moment, the story, like the moment the design of the public space was was finished within actually a month or so, and it became a place where babies are playing, then the discussion completely changed because then your discussion is about parked cars versus places for children to enjoy life. And I think this this should be actually our discussion. It should not be yes cars, no cars. It should be places for people versus 
um, yeah, versus car infrastructure, I would say. Or uh, and 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 when you have this discussion, you see that people actually believe the great quality of life, the, the lively public spaces, and you need to find a way to to show it. So it can you can use maps, you can use interventions, uh, you can try out um, interventions, or actually make a plan and just be a great leader and achieve it because sometimes it's it's very difficult and you need to just stick to your plan and, and do it um all i'm saying is that uh yeah thinking about this projects of course we showed only the nice and successful ones but there are also many failing projects it's very easy to give up uh, because it is uh, difficult and you are messing up with the life of people when you are uh, planning public space and uh, planning uh, streets. Uh, but if you believe that you are doing the right thing and you also do it together with the community and uh, you listen uh, actually to what people want and ask for, uh, and not only the people that can speak out, actually the people that don't know how to speak out or the people that have uh, the, their voice is silenced and they're never being asked, if you do that, I think it is uh, yeah, being an urban planner is an amazing job, and uh, I hope more people will join the the cause uh, of not only being an urban planner but just being activists or urbanists and and uh, yeah, just influence yeah. what's going on on, on their cities. And and you said it earlier too, is that you know that ability to do things more on a tactical basis, you know, in, in, you know, sort of channeling tactical urbanism and doing things lighter, quicker, cheaper, and putting things out and testing them and seeing how they, how people respond to them. Um, honestly, the the biggest challenge, of course, from a human behavior perspective, is that change is fear inducing, and so oftentimes some of the things that we hear, and, and you touched upon it just a moment ago, is that you know folks will sort of get, you know, uh, concerned about how, how's this going to uh, impact my ability to, to get around or how's this, or, or to get through, or how's this going to uh, impact my ability as a business owner uh, to thrive if people aren't able to drive, you know, quickly through this corridor and, and park right in front of my business. And so, having to you know be empathetic to those fears and those concerns because uh, if they're feeling them, if they're thinking them, they are legitimate. And so you need to be able to give them space and being able to trial these types of initiatives and create uh, an opportunity to learn, to live it and to learn from it helps to allay some of the, the fears that may be there. Plus, it's a great opportunity to learn because you may realize that, you know, oh, in this environment, you know, it, it you know, that cut and paste of a different, uh, you know, application from a different location didn't fly. But with these tweaks, with these sort of uh, improvements and adjustments, uh, it, it works much better. And, uh, and I think that that's one of the whole points, because ultimately, when we go back to, you know, the photos of the vibrancy in what happens, uh, you know, it helps allay some of those fears, because oftentimes that's one of the most significant resistance, um, you know, platforms that are out there is that local businesses are like, how are we going to survive? Don't you understand how hard it is for us to do business? And, you know, it's like when you can demonstrate either through storytelling and sharing of, of these types of photos um, or through demonstration projects and being able to show it, uh, it helps, it helps, you know, gain that support of, you know, that next block, that ne next group of business owners. And, and they're like, yeah, I, I don't know what we were afraid of. I mean, this is great. <laughs> I actually, so. I, I, I have to say that, uh, I, I don't have enough money to do it, but I would yeah. actually promise to any business, any, in most dense cities, I mean, Tel Aviv is an example, but mm -hmm. most uh, dense, uh, um, lively cities in Europe that I know, I would literally put my savings on uh, promising all business owners that limiting car traffic and creating lively streets will attract more customers. Yeah, It is always end up better. It never fails. Yeah, yeah. There are places where it fails, and this is because there is not enough density around the area or 
yeah, you closed it for cars, but you didn't create great connection for uh, transit, cycling, and walking. Yeah. But where those elements are there, I would definitely always bet my money there. Um, yeah. Because it always it always ends up working. It's incredible yeah. how it always works. Well, and I think to your point is the difference between this and this. You know, yeah. what I mean, I mean and, and the and, and for the audio only audience, what I'm showing here is the image of of that interim step, that first interim step of this street where the bollards were put up. So the the motor vehicle through access was limited, but. As you mentioned earlier, that wasn't enough. You need to now activate the space. You can't just cut motor vehicle traffic through traffic off. You need to do that next step. You need to, uh, and I like to frame this when I talk about, uh, you know, building protected and separated bicycle infrastructure and active mobility infrastructure. It can't just be that bare minimum of safe. It needs to be truly inviting. It needs to be something that really uh, embraces people and attracts people to, to want to be able to use that facility, to want to be able to occupy that public space. So truly inviting and welcoming and engaging. You do that and you will have vitality. You will have vibrancy. Good stuff. And you will have it very, very, very quickly. Yes, so exactly. Just- yeah, have yes, some uh, courage, and you will uh, you will find the success quickly. Have the courage, and you will find that success quickly. I love it, Lior. Thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been so much fun. Thank you very much for inviting me, and it was lovely. It went fast. It did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode with Lior Steinberg. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. Share it with a friend. And of course, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel and just click on the subscribe button down below and ring the bell to indicate what your notifications preferences might be. Also, I'd be honored to have you check out the Active Town store for some fun and zany streets are for people swag. And finally, please consider supporting my efforts and the Active Towns channel via my Patreon page at patreon.com slash active towns. Link is in the show notes and in the video description down below. Again, thank you so very much for tuning in. This is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>